get started shortly, so if you can quiet down. I'd like to welcome everyone to the event tonight. My name is Angela Miller. I'm the Vice President of the Native American Cultural Awareness Association. Tonight, Ward Churchill, professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder, will be speaking about racism against the American Indian. Tomorrow's event, Jim Northrup will be speaking about Indians in Vietnam, and Mr. Neil Hall is teaching us on Thursday about why we were created. We're going to bring up Chancellor Miller for welcoming remarks right now. Thank you. Welcome to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater's third annual Native Pride Week. Native Pride Week is dedicated to increasing awareness about Native American issues through a series of lectures. And I would say as a side, apparently you have created an awareness. <laughs> this year our students, staff, and guests have the opportunity to hear and interact with a diverse group of speakers, including Ada Deer, the first Native American woman to head the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Jim Northrup, a storyteller from the Fond du Lac Reservation in northern Minnesota, and Neil Hall, a spiritual leader and traditional teacher from Manitoba, Canada. And of course, Professor Ward Churchill, who will be introduced in a few moments. I extend my sincere thanks to the student organizers of Native Pride Week for all their hard work selecting speakers, arranging these events, and helping make Native Pride Week a valuable experience. The Native American Cultural Awareness Association, with assistance from the university's Native American Support Services, has spent many, many hours planning for this week. Just as an aside, I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but it seems to me that there is more interest in the third annual Native Pride Week than there was in the first two. The press, the press coverage is obviously a good bit bigger than it was last night when I heard Ada Deer in her, in her presentation, which was excellent for the portion I was able to hear, and I commend to all of you. I also want to thank all the other sponsors who were involved and supported this effort. To everyone, thanks for all the work that was, went into this. About this evening's presentation, let me once again note that regardless of some opinions to the contrary, it is still my belief that the Academy is at its best when it functions as a forum for the free exchange of ideas. Furthermore, I, apparently unlike some others, have faith that our faculty, our staff, and our students are able to decide for themselves whether to listen and to critically assess the messages of those who speak on our campus. I do not share the fear of words that apparently is becoming more prevalent in our society. Again, welcome students, staff, and guests to the third annual Native Pride Week. Thank you. And thank you for those remarks, Chancellor Miller. It is now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Salida, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Stephen Salaita. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Languages and Literatures. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Ward Churchill of the Ethnic Studies Department at the University of Colorado at Boulder. First, however, I'd like to take a second to recognize the students of the Native American Cultural Awareness Association who have worked tirelessly putting this evening's event together, as well as all the proceedings of a truly spectacular Native Pride Week. 
These students embody all the human beauty evident in Indian cultures from time immemorial, and collectively they've made the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater a better place to study and learn. And now, onto the reason you have all gathered here. Professor Churchill arrives at the podium with a Herculean record of scholarship and activism. Author and editor of more than 15 books, Professor Churchill is widely recognized in the field of Native American studies as an authority on multiple issues. Among them, Indian land reclamation struggles, Native intellectual histories, Indian insurgency and activism, the genocide of North and South America's indigenous peoples, the destruction of the North American environment, FBI and CIA counterinsurgency, sovereignty and self-determination in Indian country, and racism against the American Indian, the topic of his lecture tonight. Professor Churchill also can claim expertise in numerous issues beyond those having to do immediately with Indian nations, among them the exploitation of so-called third world populations, the occupation of Iraq and Palestine, the insustainability of plutocracy, or the government of the wealthy, and the social systems of tribal or otherwise traditional populations. The final point is of utmost importance. Professor Churchill often is misrepresented as being many things, liberal, Marxist, fascist, anti-American, the list goes on. But Professor Churchill, neither a fan nor an advocate of such meaningless labels, ultimately is nothing other than indigenous. And it's this worldview, a worldview born of the infinite wisdom perpetually evinced by indigenous peoples around the planet that we are especially lucky to hear and I hope heed this evening. And now I present to you Ward Churchill.
you hello my relatives good to see you here I bring you greetings from the elders of the Kadua Band of Cherokee my people from the American Indian Movement of Colorado of which I've been a part since before a lot of you in this room were even alive and from Gorthy Lass otherwise known as Leonard Peltier, who tonight as I speak to you continues to sit in a cage to federal prison at Leavenworth, Kansas. Not for anything anyone, including even his prosecutor, has been prepared in any point in the last 20 years to say they knew or even believed he actually did. Rather, Leonard Peltier serves as a symbol of the arbitrary ability of the federal government of the United States to repress the legitimate aspirations to liberation of indigenous people within its claim boundaries. And there's a big difference between a claim and a reality. Isn't this amazing? I do 40 gigs a year speaking to issues having to do with the denial of indigenous rights in this country and in Canada for that matter, the whole continent. Speaking to issues like Native people experiencing a lifespan one-third shorter than the general population of the conditions in northern Manitoba being such that seven in every ten children between the ages of nine and twelve actively inhale gasoline to try to blot out their consciousness just in the moment not just then, but in full knowledge that any time they do it, it could be permanent. Permanently wishing not to understand, not to perceive the reality they inhabit. I speak to these things, and there's seldom even the interest on the part of the media for an interview in the local paper. I spoke to something else, and look at this circus. We have an almost impossible assignment tonight. I was asked to come here and speak to what I tend to speak to as a rule. But now there's the famous phrase. So we're gonna to try to take the famous phrase and address that and take that reality that I was just addressing, the one I habitually address, and put them together and do it an hour. And that's not gonna do either of them justice, but that's the assignment. So what you're gonna get is skimming the surface in a way. It's gonna be highlights. Because we have some time I'm reserved for direct interaction between you and me. But before I go there, I'd like to express my appreciation to the community here, particularly the Native Students Association, and particularly within that, Doug Keel and Angela Miller, for having the integrity and the backbone not to cave in in front of the Bill O'Reilly's of the world. It's a tough time, and there's a lot of symbolism involved. But for those of you who have the good sense not to watch Common Sense, to watch Fox News, and particularly O'Reilly, and I don't want to confuse Fox News and Common Sense in any way at all, so I apologize for the little lapse there. You may notice that O'Reilly continues to say that he does not oppose my right to free speech or that of anyone else. What he opposes is me being paid on tax dollars, under which I understand that there are none invested tonight, so he needn't have worried. You can say anything you want, you just don't get to say it on the taxpayer's buck. And in an interchange with an official from this university, at a certain point, he or one of his running dogs suggested that they just send me the check and not have me come. Now that doesn't sound much like I have freedom of speech, but you shouldn't be paying me on a taxpayer's dollar. It's okay if I get paid as long as I don't talk, and that's the message, and that's out of the horse's mouth. But the whole community here, a little different than Wheaton, 
liberal college in the Northeast in Massachusetts. And a little different than Eastern Washington, who without any kind of pressure being brought to bear, well, I shouldn't say the institution because it wasn't. The president of the institution in the interest of public safety preemptorily canceled a speech, then causing his entire faculty unanimously to vote to overriding and are now fortunately attempting to secure his resignation. And just like it was here when the issue came up, I will be there on an appointed date and I will be speaking to those who wanted to hear me to consider the issues. And that never was the president of the institution. You see, when they deny me the right to speak, they also deny you the right to hear. So it's not simply an abridgment of the First Amendment right or the academic freedom rights of Ward Churchill. It's your academic freedom rights and it's your First Amendment rights that are impaired as well in the broader society in addition to that. That's the issues here. And the issues are points of view are to be constrained across the academy as a whole. That's the agenda openly announced on Joe Scarborough's program by no less than Newt Gingrich. That is the agenda that has been announced by Lynn Cheney and her friends for a long period of time. And it's okay, I suppose, to wander around the hallowed halls of the academy talking about anything you want so long as no one is listening or at least very few people. So long as there's no concrete engagement, so long as there's no resonance, it's okay, you're free to speak so long as no one listens. But the moment they begin to listen, then, well, you read the newspapers and you watch television the same as anybody else and you're in an institutional context. And one of the more favorable ones, I might add, they tell me you're becoming the, uh, what is it, Berkeley of Wisconsin, because you actually have controversial points of view presented. <laughs> Let's talk about the controversial point of view. <clears throat> and framing that, I need to say that I follow an instruction that was provided to me by a long deceased spiritual leader, my father's people, or Muskogee, their creek, is Philip Deere. And he told me my particular aptitude and my particular set of experiences growing up equipped me to talk to you in a way that he couldn't, but that he could talk to me. That didn't make me him, and it doesn't make me you. It puts me squarely between the two. And he said to me that I've always held as a way to set my path, is one, speak the truth as you see it and never ever back off it. I do and I don't. And always make a point, he said, to take native people and put them back in their rightful place in the flow of history among the community of nations as equals. And I try to do that. So now we go to the famous piece in the utterance. And I'll start with what I didn't say. And what I didn't say is what was uniformly attributed to me in the mass media for the first couple weeks of this. I never anywhere in that essay used the word justify. I didn't justify anything. I spoke to a phenomena that I believe to be natural and inevitable given a certain understanding of historical reality. Natural and inevitable is not something you justify. You don't have to justify a glacier. A glacier being natural and inevitable simply exists independent of human justification. Nor did I advocate the events of 9 -1 or replications of them. You don't have to advocate glaciers or volcanoes or tornadoes, natural and inevitable phenomena. Either they exist independent of any human intervention. You point to the phenomena and you try to understand it. And that was the exercise at hand. Well, you don't see too much of this Churchill call for the deaths of millions of Americans because I never did that. And that's been corrected and they couldn't play that song too long. That dog won't hunt. You don't hear too much in the media more about Churchill justifying and advocating because I never did that either. And on CNN, 
I challenged Paula Zahn to point to the word justify or advocate anywhere in the piece she was holding in her hand, and she changed the subject. And the reason she changed the subject is because those words and those positions simply weren't there. What was that piece about? Some people push back, which is basically an op-ed gut response written within 12 hours of the event. What was that piece about? And more importantly, what's the piece about that evolves out of it, the refined and developed piece called The Ghosts of 911 that appears in a book called On the Justice of Roosting Chickens, published in 2003, readily available to anybody out there who wants to know what I said and why I said it, what I was drawing on what my sources were and all the rest of that. 178 footnotes in that footnote-free polemic they say I wrote. Part of a 300-odd page book that is absolutely data-laden, nothing but lists, chronologies. Maybe we'll come back to that in a bit. Although it is worth noting, as they don't tend to note in the mass media, that the offending piece ultimately took runner-up for Gustavus Meyer's Award for Best Writing in Human Rights for 2004. Wouldn't seem that that would be such a great secret that it would be totally eclipsed from the coverage of the so-called offending piece. But what was that about? I've already said it was a gut response. I've already said it was a polemic. I've already said that it was written rapidly enough that it could be posted actually on 9-12. But it was, that, it was written during the afternoon and early evening of 9-11, 2001. And it was an attempt to explain, not least to myself, what it was that had happened. My experience of that was as follows. I was sitting at my word processor in Atlanta, Georgia, where I happened to be staying at the time, doing what it is that I tend to do in the morning when a telephone rang and a friend call, was calling to say, do you have your TV on? Said no. Said, well, turn it on because somebody just flew a plane into the World Trade Center. Well, that got my attention, so I did, in time to watch the second plane come in in real time. And it occurred to me as I'm watching this that this is not happening by accident. And it was occurring to the people who were filming it and providing the video feeds in real time, too. And they're remarking upon the fact that a plane has hit the Pentagon and there's another plane or two planes or three planes. They're not sure how many planes, but there's planes also missing. They don't know what's going to happen with them. But as that's occurring and before the first building comes down, it's already on all three channels because I'm switching back and forth between the three major cable news channels. On all three channels, this is being explained as absolutely senseless act. And I'm saying to myself, senseless. Senseless means without purpose. Somebody did this with this kind of coordination and with this kind of results and they had no purpose in mind, that's absolutely ridiculous. But it's already being boxed for people, already being spun for people. There couldn't possibly be a reason. But then they began to sort of have little cracks in the armor and they're saying, how could this happen? Well, legitimate question. But already before the second building comes down, why do they hate us so much? Well, obviously, Hate's entering in now, there is a purpose. But it's all this garble, and of course, within 24 hours, we have the first instant official explanation. They, whoever they were, and they weren't even identified yet, did it because they were evil, and in the form of the evils, because they hate our freedom. They hate our freedom. Well, that would pretty well sum it up. I thought maybe it might be otherwise, and I thought maybe that would be kind of pap coming out of the senseless act that would be passed off in the public, so perhaps we ought to look at the phenomena more closely. I'm assuming that it's not senseless, at least to the degree that it has a purpose. What might my, that purpose be? How could this happen? That goes to motive. What might the motive be that would cause this obviously purposive act to have occurred? And maybe that would even tie into why do they hate us? Well, see, it occurred to me that very afternoon when they're framing it in terms of hate that there's some relevance to a 1963 statement by a guy named Malcolm X, who some of you may have heard of. And they asked him the afternoon of the Kennedy assassination what he thought that meant. And he said as far as he was concerned, it was just a case of the chickens coming home to roost. 
that the purveyors of American policy were reaping what they sowed, and they did it at the highest level. The chickens were coming home to roost. And I thought this might just be a case of the same thing happened, roosting chickens, chickens coming home to roost. But now how do we understand chickens? I've had people actually ask me, what is a roosting chicken? We have an urbanized population doesn't even relate to the terminology of the 1960s anymore. So I said, maybe you can take those chickens and you can compare them to something else that might be a little more accessible to the general popular consciousness. How about instead of calling them chickens, we liken them to ghosts or wraiths or spirits, different terms, different traditions, they would all apply. Whichever one suits you best, pick it up. Maybe there were some ghosts or spirits, the ancestors coming home in the form of those planes. It wasn't just 19 guys with box cutters. There was something that went to their motive that was involved, and I found it in that form. But now whose ghosts would they be? Well, it occurred to me right off in that afternoon that it might have something to do with a half million Iraqi children. I understand there's a prayer vigil going on, lit candles out there. I'm sure it's for the Iraqi children, all half million of them. Might have to do with these half million dead Iraqi children. What were described as needless deaths resulting from the U.S. imposition of sanctions on Iraq in order to impose the notion of freedom in the form of George Herbert Walker Bush's 1991 statement that what the world and that regime in particular has to learn is that what we say goes. Now there's a freedom ideal for you, what we say goes. And the half million wasn't a nebulous figure. People want to pick at it now, but in 1996, it was confirmed on no less public a venue than Madeleine Albright, then secretary, excuse me, ambassador to the United Nations, soon to become secretary of state of the United States, which is asked by Leslie Stahl, are you aware of this data? They're saying 565,000 Iraqi children have died as a result of the sanctions since 1991. She says, yes, we're aware of it and we've decided it's worth the price. The price in someone else's children. A half million children out of a population of 20 million. Oh yeah, I'm told those were UN sanctions. How can you blame the US? They were so much UN sanctions that the high commissioner in charge of the sanctions, Dennis Halliday, resigned in protest, describing the policy as one of deliberate genocide. I thought maybe somebody might be upset about that. And it occurred to me somebody might be upset about Palestinian kids get shot in the head for throwing rocks during the Intifada. An entire population displaced from its homeland, turned into refugees, living in refugee camps for the last two generations. I thought maybe somebody might be upset about that. And I had another list. The rest of my list wasn't on the list that was provided by the Al-Qaeda organization within 72 hours when they stated what their motives had actually been. But the first two items on their list were the Iraqi children and the Palestinians. Of course, it's been pointed out to me since there wasn't a single Iraqi on a plane. There wasn't a single Palestinian on one of those planes. So what are you talking about? That's what upset them. Well, what I said in response to that, not in the piece, but in response to that query, which I'll deal with right now, is that you treat any people the way the Iraqis and the Palestinians have been treated, not only destroying them en masse, but demeaning, degrading, and devaluing them to the point of absolute dehumanization, encompassing their losses under terms like collateral damage, absolutely devoid of humanity. And it doesn't matter whether you're an Arab or an American, you're going to respond pretty much the same way. You're going to lash out in blind hatred violently in a form that they tend to call terrorism. And I feel utterly validated in having taken that position by the behavior of people in upstate New York who responded with such potential violence, considered credible by the counterterrorism unit of the New York State Police. That Americans just like Arabs, when they feel they're treated that way, when their loved ones, their lost ones are demeaned and degraded, will respond with what's called terroristic intent. Yeah. 
We're going to come back to some of that a little bit later because it doesn't, doesn't just take the form of overt threats of violence. This is water. Thank you. Well, let's go back to my list because it didn't end in Palestine. It went to a slit trench in Panama where a bunch of Panamanians were liberated from a CIA-imposed nominal head of state by the name of Manuel Noriega under the premise of serving a drug warrant on him. People who were never supposed to have died were uncovered buried under a layer of quicklime. I thought maybe there was a little resentment around that one too. In Grenada, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, thought maybe the ghosts of quarter million Highland Mayans who have been slaughtered by military dictatorships one after another pursuant to the CIA's 1954 overthrow of the duly elected Arbenz regime might figure in. Thought maybe what Robert McNamara estimates as being 3.2 million Indo-Chinese who died as a result of the United States preserving their freedom by waging outright warfare on a nutritional basis in order to prevent them having the government of the form and organizing their society in the form and arranging their economy in the form that they themselves chose, they might be there. I thought the bodies in the wells and under the bridges at places like Nogun Ri in Korea, where the United States imposed and enforced partition of their particular country, Korea, during the early 1950s, I thought some of those collateral damages, outright massacred, thought they might be there. Thought maybe the 180,000 odd Japanese incinerated in two nuclear bombings, well, we're all worried about weapons of mass destruction. We live in the only country that's ever actually used them, at least nuclear weapons. Not to win the war, but to send a message very similar to what we say goes to Joe Stalin as the war wound up, that we have a technological military capability that so transcends yours that you're going to have to take instruction from us. We're going to have a world order that we dictate the terms of to our own advantage, that kind of thing. 180,000 civilians, plus or minus a few, to communicate that message. I thought maybe, maybe, They'd be there, but they aren't a half of it. They're a fraction. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were both selected as targets because they were relatively undamaged and not of particular military importance. They were civilian targets to make the point. But then out there in the Nevada and Utah deserts, they built reconstructions of Japanese cities in order to perfect the incendiary devices and the burn patterns, as they call them, in order to be able to inflict maximum damage on Japanese cities and Japan itself. These were Curtis LeMay's B-29 fire raids, 110,000 civilians incinerated in Tokyo in one night by design. The head of the bombing campaign actually announced for the record that he wanted to kill every single Japanese that inhabited the islands. Who knows? In the totality of the fire raids, how many Japanese were consumed? But we can catapult a little bit now back to the Philippines, where a bunch of old Indian fighters who'd made their bones in the northern plains assembled to free the islands from Spanish colonialism in order to turn it into a U.S. colony and fought a war against what they called Moros, or the Indians of the Philippines, that was the other term used, to the extent that somewhere between 600,000 and a million and a half of them were killed in barely three years. Entire provinces on Luzon turned into what hell-roaring Jake Smith, that was the general's name, referred to as a howling wilderness, totally devoid of population. That in the name of the freedom and the American way. I talk about these things sometimes. I don't get press conferences as a result. Hmm. How might that be? That little war in the Philippines, that Indian war as they called it, 
commenced barely 10 years after the last major massacre of what they erroneously refer to as the Indian Wars here. I say erroneous because the signifier there suggests that the Indians are starting the wars. You remember when the Indians got in birch bark canoes along the Atlantic coast and began rowing resolutely across the Atlantic in order to invade London, having come up the Thames. The indigenous American invasion of Europe, instigating a Holocaust, yeah, right. The Indians were from coast to coast, from border to border, north and south, defending themselves against being overrun and exterminated, and that was the terms used. Wounded Knee was just a punctuation point on the process that occurred in 1890. And from there, you've got an uninterrupted stream of massacres, wholesale and retail, that run back in a continuous tone or a continuous line from Wounded Knee to the Marias River, from the Marias River, to the Washita, from the Washita forward again to Sand Creek, to the Sapa Creek, backwards to Horseshoe Bend, and on and on, all the way to the elimination of the Wappingers. You all know about the Wappingers, right? No, it wasn't their name for themselves. It's some great white expert, historian, anthropologist, or combination of the two that bestowed some European name upon them. Their name is lost to history, or at least to me, because I don't know what they would have called themselves. In the books, you'll find them listed as the Wappingers. They're, those are the guys that supposedly sold a place named Manhattan Island to the Dutch for a handful of glass beads and trinkets. But of course they didn't. What they did was rent some of their property for the Dutch to establish a trading center that would be mutually beneficial when the Dutch attempted to press the claim that this was actually a bill of sale that they'd acquired. The Wappingers objected and then they resolved the manner in the manner that we have been talking about playing the record back forward through the whole endless series of massacres. They sent a little military expedition, volunteers they were, not formal troops, those who had a vested interest in the Dutch enterprise at the tip of Manhattan Island, they sent them north up the island to the Wappinger encampment with assignment to exterminate the Indians. They expected this might take a little while, but it didn't. They managed to accomplish this feat of arms in barely an afternoon. So rapidly and so successfully, they felt they would be disbelieved when they returned back to the southern tip of the island to their own establishment. And so they collected the heads of those slain, at least the principal male leaders, those that were thought to be the fighting force, and they carried them in baskets back to New Amsterdam, as it was called at the time. The citizenry turned out and expressed great satisfaction with the military prowess of those who had sallied forth. And they came to celebrate the event by conducting a jolly game of kickball in the public square of New Amsterdam, a location very nearly where the foundations of the World Trade Center would come to be. And for the ball, they used the heads, one after another, of those slain and decapitated. And that was not something by some marginal group of Hannibal Lecter-like individuals. This was an event participated in and attended by virtually the entire community. Now that's the legacy that I thought might have been attending, but that's not the end of it either. The World Trade Center, as you probably know, was situated off the end of something called Wall Street. Wall Street takes its name from the wall enclosing the slave quarters of the slave market of what had become by the time it was established New York. That was absolutely central to the evolution of the economy, which has resulted in New York ultimately being the financial capital of the entire planet. You cannot separate that beginning from this outcome. And so, while the bulk of them went to places in the Caribbean and to Brazil and so forth, you still got a considerable proportion of those who were lost to the middle passage of the slave trade at issue as being quite probably among the ghosts, the wraiths, the spirits, the chickens who went into the World Trade Center. 
And this is not even the talk of the things that are really inseparable from, but not directly enunciable as being a part of the main flow of that history, that continuous tone of slaughtering of the brown-skinned other that has attended U.S. enterprise militarily and financially from before the United States even existed. He'd have to talk about the Indians lost over the generations to the proclamation of scalp bounties, that is, payment for proof of death in the form of the scalp or the bloody red skin of an Indian, any Indian, on a graduated scale paying most for an adult male, less for an adult female, less yet for a child, a child being defined as an individual of either sex under 10 years of age. These occurred in every single state and territory of the 48 contiguous states and every single antecedent colony now celebrated with holidays like, oh, I don't know, Thanksgiving. Or the children devoured by America's good intentions. These are all done for your own good. See, if you actually read an Orthodox history of the United States or North America, you'll find out there's never anything ever been done to the indigenous population. There have only been things done for us. One of which was, for example, the boarding schools, the residential schools, as they're called in Canada which operated under the express purpose articulated by the architect, Captain Richard Henry Pratt, on the principle of killing the Indian, saving the man, and every single student taken there. Note the juxtaposition to be Indian, you couldn't be a man, by which he meant human. To be Indian was inhuman. To be human, you had to stop being Indian, and they had this mechanism to impose a regime on the children to affect their overall deculturation, reculturating them to serve as manual labor in the overall labor force of the dominant society. They meant to take every single Indian child between the ages of four and 15. They never made it, mainly because good budget conscious governors and legislators didn't want to appropriate the money to make it possible, but for five consecutive generations, they got roughly 50%. One in every two children were processed through these institutions in which the conditions were such that for whole periods of that, one in every two who went in never came out alive. That's 25% of the population. 25% of the indigenous population consumed in this noble effort to civilize Indians by virtue of taking their Indianness away and confusing the issue. Oh yeah, I can keep going. There's a lot of ghosts. There's a lot of karma. All of this is demeaned, degraded, devalued, dismissed from the course of orthodox interpretation of American triumphalist history. It means every single signifier out there is a potential source of the kind of sentiment that would lead to something like 911. But in the course of doing this, the American public as a whole has taken upon itself a sense of divine entitlement that these things can go on, remarked upon with a certain degree of horror from time to time, but ultimately with absolute impunity. It is done to them, but how dare they even consider doing it to us? That would be a crime. That would be an atrocity. That would be absolutely unforgivable. Oh, we oppose the policy. We oppose the policies in general. We oppose these things happening, even as we benefit and profit from them and do nothing more significant than hold prayer vigils, burn incense, adopt new clothing styles, listen to proper music, sign petitions, elect Tweedledee as opposed to Tweedledum, and allow the process to go on while we reside feeling good about ourselves because we've articulated some kind of an opposition even as the machinery of carnage continues to grind an ever more refined form, ever more efficient form, consuming ever more ultimately brown-skinned others. That's the nature of the phenomena as I defined it. If you operate this way, with this attitude, that the other doesn't count if it would inconvenience you to alter the nature of their fate in any way at all. You're going to generate a response that ultimately says, 
what you put out, you will get back. The term is blowback. Naturally, inevitably, and unless something changes permanently, the jeopardy will be there. The questions were being posed during the afternoon of 911. How might we secure ourselves from these things? Well, we've seen how it was done, and it was one option, one venue for attempting that. We've cloned out Delta Force units. We've built tiger cages at Guantanamo Bay. We've licensed torture. We've invaded two countries. We've bombed their populations. We've generated collateral damage. We've offered bounties on the heads of selected terrorists. We've repealed the rights of most Americans. Things that would have been considered fundamental when I was your age are no longer even on the books. These are simply taken for granted that for your own good to ensure your security. You don't need, you have to compromise them. Negotiate your rights or give them up in the interests of what? You think this line of security is going to secure you or your children or what you hold dear? If you think so, ask the Israelis. They have the world's most refined security state of this type. And they have had it for a long time. And I think sometime this week, somebody walked into a nightclub wearing a bundle of dynamite and blew a bunch of them right out onto the street. 14-year-old kids have been doing that. That's how secure that makes you. If you want to hang your hat for securing yourself and your children on that horse, hey, count me out. If they can't do it in a relatively small country, how in the hell do you think you're going to do it in this overwhelmingly large one? It's not going to work if you gave up every single right you had and attempted to obliterate every single person out there that you held to be suspect, they're still going to get you. In fact, they're probably going to be more intent upon getting you doing that than they would have been in the first place, and they're going to have every reason for feeling that way because they're feeling just like you would in the same position. So if that's not to be the way security is secured, what would be? Well, I offered a really, really radical proposal there. Get ready. The revolution's at hand. It's almost biblical when you break it down. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, okay? Now, on that score, I figured I would immediately enlist the fervent support of the Christian right. Wow, was I wrong about that? Oh, it's out there and it's biblical. It's one of those things you encant in Sunday school, but they didn't mean it for a moment. They only mean it, if at all, regard to themselves. Kind of like the folks that gather with candles to commemorate people they never managed to commemorate on the anniversary of their deaths. They just do it when somebody tries to call it the right name, okay? But let's run through the really, the core, the phrase. See, I've got 24 books in print, 70 book chapters, about 100 journal articles, introductions, prefaces. I've got a pile of paper that I've written about that deep. Okay? Of that, we're focused now on one less than 20 page essay, within well, that essay, one phrase. And we're going to assess the whole on that basis, usually by people who have not even read that. The little Eichmanns. Notice I didn't say Eichmann. I said the little Eichmanns. Who did I mean by that, first of all? For the first two weeks of this, there was a continuous tone of misrepresentation in the form of how can you call the janitors, the food service workers, the random passersby, 18-month-old child on an airplane. How can you call them Eichmanns? How can you make this connection at all? Well, the fact of the matter is I never did, and that was perfectly obvious if you actually read the piece. I talked about a technocratic core of empire. Now, somebody out there, particularly someone in the opposition to what I've said, 
Want to give me some sort of a coherent definition of how somebody who pushes a broom for a living can be considered a technician of any sort? Could I possibly have been describing an 18-month-old child as a technician, a member of a technocratic core of empire? Obviously not. That was absolutely a diversion from the actual issue. Nobody was particularly concerned with the janitors and the food service workers. Never were. They didn't want to talk about who I was talking about. Well, we finally got in there. Eichmann. Who the hell was Eichmann? See, when I uttered that name, and used it the way I did, in a symbolic way, I, and this was my mistake, presumed a considerably greater degree of conversance with the nature of the human being at issue and what he did, and the conclusions drawn on that basis by somebody named Hannah Arendt, who wrote a definitive work on the meaning of Eichmann called Eichmann in Jerusalem. Subtitle, A Report on the Banality of Evil. And I think I'll back into it right through a writ. See, she was Jewish, an important Jewish scholar in the 1950s. And when they captured Eichmann and whisked him away from Argentina to stand trial in Israel, she went. She asked for the assignment, says, I want to report this. Because to her, Eichmann epitomized evil. He was an absolutely essential ingredient in making the final solution possible. Not that he killed Jews. Not that he commanded a unit that did. No, he sat in a bureau in Berlin and arranged train schedules and logistics to make the final solution possible. He never directly killed anybody as far as I know, certainly not a Jew. And he was never accused by the Israelis of having done so. He was a nondescript little bureaucrat who was entirely proficient at his job, who didn't even believe in the policy he was implementing, expressed not only reservations but opposition to it, but he's in this structure, and this is his job. How do you excel? He made the train loads of Jews arrive on time at the gates of the death camps, and he made sure that the trains coming back were filled with eyeglasses, clothing of value, the gold extracted from the teeth. He made sure that the deliveries of Zyklon B occurred in sufficient quantities and on time. And in that context, he was symbolic. Oh yes, he did what he did, but he symbolized everybody who worked under him, who of course was not actually Eichmann. They would be little Eichmanns. People that did not even necessarily know the particulars of what they were doing, but they performed fun their functions absolutely proficiently to make his bureau hum. He symbolized as well the technicians standing there manufacturing the Zyklon B in quantities that could not possibly have been used for exterminating lice. The guys at the switchyard that made sure the trains got through and repaired the track to keep the trains running even when the Allies were bombing them. People who had nothing to do with the literal killing but without whom the killing would not have been possible, the carnage would have been lessened at the very least. And each of them, in their own way, in knowledge of what it was, what was happening, did their jobs for personal security, for belief in the ideals of the fatherland, for whatever set of circumstances, they did their jobs well and made it work, whatever their personal objections were. These were not monsters any more than the people in the Twin Towers were monsters. They were good family men for the most part. Eichmann's children loved him. He took care of his family. He was a civic-minded individual. He participated in charities. He learned Hebrew. He knew more about Judaism than a lot of Jews. He wanted to understand his phenomena too. She went there to confront what she expected to be the monstrous. And what she encountered was the absolute nondescript reality of the man. Nothing distinguished him from the mass. He was a little gray mouse. And she concluded, the horror of Eichmann is not that he was a Nazi. Of course he was. But on the basis of understanding Eichmann, you understand that anyone 
messed up in a system that generates carnage, who does her job in a bureaucratic fashion proficiently, could be a Nazi. Hence, Little Eichmanns, people who pursued the purpose of maximizing profit through the imposition of IMF forms of stability for American investment, and so on, and so on, and so on. In full knowledge that the result is the mass immiseration and death of millions of others out there that you will not be held accountable for because the society as a whole absolutely devalues and ignores them. When Madeleine Albright said what she said, there was a little ripple, oh, and everybody went back to business as usual while the children continued to die. And no, it was not because of the Oil for Food program. That happens as a result of the 500,000. And whatever misappropriation and diversion of funds to building palaces for Saddam Hussein that entailed, the fact of the matter is the attrition among the children went down once that program began. Oh yeah, that half million is entirely ha on the hands of the United States, and the United States demonstrated conclusively to those in the receiving end that it did not care one bit. And the Eichmanns went about their business. Well, the Pentagon, which was hit that day, is a straight-up military target. You can't get more military. What do they call that when a Pentagon holds a press conference? That's called command and control infrastructure. Nice term, hey? The World Trade Center, now that's a different story. That's a primarily, at least, civilian target. That would be a war crime. In fact, I would say that it was a war crime. I wouldn't say it was any more of a war crime than the 8th Air Force saturation bombing of the German industrial complex with all the precision they had available. The British U.S. allies which the U.S. was coordinating its air operations, actually had a goal to kill a million German civilians and unhouse 10 million more in order to break the morale of the population. That was a stated goal, and the U.S. participated in that. But you go back to the bombing of Baghdad. You can actually get the tapes. You don't need to take my word for it. You can get the transcripts, too. Order them up when they're talking about major civilian targets having been obliterated by U.S. smart bombs, that's not happening by accident. Those things usually function as designed. Once in a while, one goes awry, but there's no argument that these are those cases. What it is, the Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell and Donald Rumsfeld and their friends habitually say when that happens is that the evil leadership of the other side situated elements of their command and control and otherwise civilian occupied targets, okay? That makes it all okay. It makes it all right. At least I don't hear a great deal of dissonance coming from the public when these explanations are offered when it happens to somebody else. They use the same sort of justification with regard to the bombing that was occurring in Bosnia. It's justified by the fact that they put intelligence, facilities, military facilities, command and control infrastructure, in other words, in these civilian targets in order to try to buffer them from being obliterated by U.S. firepower. What well, we know now, the Central Intelligence Agency had located facilities in the World Trade Center. The Defense Department had located facilities in the World Trade Center. There were other entities that could be considered part of command and control infrastructure that had been deliberately situated by the government of the United States in the towers. By U.S. rules, which I absolutely object to, by U.S. rules, that made them legitimate targets. If you put it out that way, you've got no complaint when it comes back. When you accept the idea that it's justifiable to do it to other people, you've got no grounds to complain when they do it back to you. If you want it not to be done, you have to change the calculus of how things get done by this country out there in the world. There's your security. But you cannot do it in a rhetorical way. So the United States has always postured itself to be the most humane, the most enlightened, the most law-abiding, and the most peaceful of all countries that have ever existed. The whole world has heard that rhetoric endlessly. 
and they understand the difference between U.S. rhetoric on the one hand and U.S. reality on the other. The difference between rhetoric and reality makes the, reality, the rhetoric absolutely dysfunctional. You're not going to be able to stand up and make solemn pledges to them that we've changed our mind about what you're worth as a human being and we're going to do things different now. You're going to have to do something concrete to manifest the fact that you've actually changed. And what was it? We're going to get really, really radical again here. Here comes an extremist statement. Obey the goddamn law. Signify straight up your willingness to do things in a not unilateral way, which is an absolutely criminal way. It says we will not be bound by law other than when it's convenient to us. We'll impose it on others, but we're not constrained by it. We'll set our own course. The law be damned. You've got an attorney general that's just been appointed and said the Geneva Conventions are obsolete, at least in terms of U.S. practice. No law will bind the United States. You're going to have to say the exact opposite. You're going to have to practice that. You're going to have to adhere to the law. Actually, this piece in the end ends up being a call for law enforcement. And the, the citizenry of the United States is going to have to be the enforcing entity. You're going to have to get your government on a leash, enforce its compliance with the fundamental rules of international law, the laws of war, human rights law, humanitarian law, and oh, by the way, the Constitution of the United States itself might be a nice thing to adhere to. And that's what drives them craziest, because this is the whole rank and file of those that say we need another 100,000 or 200,000 or 900,000 cops in the street. We need to double the number of prison beds. We need to get tough on crime. That by an entity that refuses the rule of law as a matter of policy pronouncement to the applause of the citizenry. And as long as that's the case, you can expect 911 to happen again and again and again as often as they could make it happen. And how could it be any other way? Law enforcement. Adherence to law. Now there's a radical proposition. I should probably be lynched for that one, don't you think? Actually, on the issue, they're not talking about this much anymore. You've got a little boilerplate out there. Now, instead of saying all the victims, I demonized all the victims and called them Eichmanns, he said, well, he called some of them. They don't say I justify, they don't say I advocate, they sure as hell don't want to talk about the legal end of things. But we really, really don't want this guy talking. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, let's stop talking about what he said and start talking about him. Many of you have heard it. Is he or is he not an Indian? <laughs> Profound schizophrenia here. I've had about 6,000 emails since this thing started. This is really fun wading through. Okay, about two-thirds of them are hostile, but they're organized hostile. They consist of about one line apiece. Okay, and you can divide them up almost equally. Sometimes it's the same person sending the emails. All right, one half of the ones that take this form go to this. He's a fraud. He's an imposter. He misrepresented himself. He's not an Indian. Now note, this is exclusively white people saying this. There's about four exceptions that I know of. It's a torrent of white people who are undoubtedly absolutely concerned with the rights and integrity of indigenous peoples. They're absolutely devoted to protecting native peoples from me passing myself off as being one and saving them from, oh, well, if somebody comes up with a what that's supposed to be there, you let me know because I haven't figured that one out. But what strikes me as bizarre, extremely interesting, revealing of an utterly deformed self-concept is that this crew could think of nothing worse to call me than a white man. And they're all white men. <laughs> Figure out what you're going to do with that one. The other side takes the exact opposite to be true. Like I said, the schizophrenia enters in because often it's the same people. First, they accuse me of being a poser. 
Masquerading as an Indian for all the benefits you get out of that. Ask the people on the reservations about the benefits that accrue to being an Indian. Okay, this is utterly idiotic on its face. But then they turn around. Well, it's kind of like this. I liken it, the effect that's occurred here, to having this gigantic boil that's gone untreated for six or eight months. And I mean, it's just an inflamed, gooey mess. It's like an overinflated basketball. It wants desperately to burst, but it can't on its own. So someone comes around and lances it, and you get this spray of pus. Hey, shitting bull. That's a good start. How are you and your squaw going to live through the night? I got called buckwheat for the first time. Confused their racial venom. Okay, seen one wog, seen them all. But the pervasive thing, and again, I feel absolutely validated in assessment of the public sensibility, if you will. Shivington should have finished the job. You know who Shivington was? Probably not. He was the Methodist minister come volunteer cavalry colonel who went into Sand Creek, a non-combatant village in southern Colorado in November of 1864, issuing his troops the instructions before they went in. Remember, boys, kill all, big and little. Nits make lice. Now, for those of you not conversant with biology sufficiently to realize what those terms mean, and knit is a baby louse. You kill the babies too because the babies will be growing up to be adults. You exterminate them all. And they killed everything they could find. Shivington should have finished the job, meaning he didn't kill all of you despite his best efforts. An absolutely out front, drooling exterminationist mentality. That's what I'm up against. But that's what Indians have been up against all along. It's about time it got brought out in public view. And they're doing that big time. But let's go to the spin on this Indian business. Who the hell's business is it who my grandmother was? other than my grandmother's, mine, my family's, and the people that accept me as being one of them and have said so, repeatedly said so, taken me and put me in their roles as well as their society kind of said so, asked me to come and join them, vetted my genealogy because they wanted to know who I was. That's been done and they've said it's been done. And not only me, but they have been mercilessly misrepresented ever since. Let me take it by the numbers. I am not, nor have I ever been, an honorary member of the Kadua Band of Cherokee like Bill Clinton. <laughs> honorary membership is what it sounds like. It's an honorific that's bestowed on someone who provides a service or demonstrates cordiality or who is respected. And they say, we feel like you're one of us. You're not but we honor you with that relation. I'm an associate member of the Kutua Band, not a full member, never said anything else. Let me explain the difference to you because this is the actual status and this is what the band's been trying to tell the media for weeks. I am of Cherokee descent, demonstrably so, according to the standards set by the federal government of the United States in defining in Indianness, which is something called blood quantum, how much part Indian are you? Hey, Brennan, you here? Good as Irish reporter that thrives on this. Wanted to have an in-depth interview about it. I said I would be glad to have this one-on-one -on -one interview with you, provided you show up with documentation of your Irish ancestry. <laughs> oh, I get your point, he says, and then goes right ahead and writes the stuff. Kevin Flynn in Denver as well. Same thing. Well, the British burned our papers. Yeah. Suppose there's a lesson there. Yeah, I get your point. Goes right ahead and writes the stuff. White guys. 
all preoccupied with the nature of identity in order to nullify and discredit. You can't get to the message, get to the messenger. I'm less than a quarter blood. Never argued any different. I claim to be a 16. That's all I've ever claimed. They said I might be as high as three sixteenths. That'd make me either a 16th less or a 16th more than John Ross, who's the greatest resistance patriot in Cherokee history, who in 1830 was one eighth Cherokee. Given our history, given the nature of our interactions, that's a perfectly respectable pedigree for us. And I can give a damn what the rest of society wants to think about it. We define who we are. My grandfather, mother defines who I am. My elders define who I am. White journalists don't. So we start there. Full members are more than a quarter blood. They hold office. They vote for those who hold office. They receive certain benefits on the basis of that particular status. Health benefits, for example, educational benefits. I don't receive any of those, don't need to. No reason why I should. Nor is a reason, or any particular reason why I should be holding office in a Kutua band. I don't live in eastern Oklahoma. Why would I be a tribal council member? Absurd on its face, and if I'm not gonna be it, and I'm not affected on the ground in the living of my day-to-day -day life, why? What I'd be voting on what the policy is going to be in those counties where the Katuas reside. No, I do other things. Other things like this, which is why I'm one of them. Or self identification, or community recognition, both of which are matters of federal law. The only thing left is the actual certificate of degree of Indian blood. Oh yeah, that's an actual legal document. Do you know of another population group anywhere on this continent that carries around like a poodle, a pedigree slip issued by the government? That's the expectation. In their own reportage, they got me identifying myself as a native in a native hostile area of the country right down the road in central Illinois, where it's not exactly a popular thing to be in the 1950s and 60s. Since I was 10 years old identifying myself as being native, why would I do that? Well, it was this really forward-looking plot to take advantage of affirmative action to get this unfair entry into a professorship at the University of Colorado in 1978. That's why when I was a 10-year-old in 1958, I would have been doing that, don't you know? <laughs> Alternate explanation. It's a little boy wandering around in central Illinois saying who he thinks he is because that's who his grandmother told him he was. And that's called self-identification. You want to check on community recognition, you get on C-SPAN. And you check that speech at the University of Colorado, and that's not a new event. That's been that way since 1980. So what's this about? This is about racism, pure and simple. When you all are required to walk around with your certificate degree of Swedish blood, German blood, Irish blood, Vietnamese blood, Ebo blood, Zulu blood, Bantu blood, to know who you are. When you're required, it'll be something perhaps other than racist, but I'd say that would be even more racist. Now it's just a particularly virulent strain of racism that is visited upon Indians and used to the advantage of non-Indians to manipulate the nature of our polity and our articulation. It's a matter of subjugation. If I can name you, if I can define you, I have absolute control over you. That's the nature of the focus of the media in one part. Or whether it was six books, one writing award, I might have been a ten-year-old boy in a professor's position with ten years teaching experience to boot, absent a self-identification on an affirmative action slip. Distort the issue and undermine it. Make the issue go away by focusing on the one who brings the issue up. 
Oh, yeah. I plagiarized myself. And two scholars have interpretive differences on two footnotes in that mass of literature I was talking about. Keeps coming out. Two scholars have said that there are problems with his scholarship. 200, including Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, and others, have said something rather different. They somehow or another never managed to get quoted. So we have Thomas Brown. Somebody want to tell me what Thomas Brown is known for? Give me his major work. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and John Lavelle, a devout political enemy, coming out of another political grouping in the Indian community who has a different interpretation of the effects of the General Allotment Act. That's the big two. Up against we put the 200 that I can list off for you if you want. Somehow or another the two keep getting press play. Noam Chomsky was quoted once and has disappeared from the newsprint altogether. And oh yeah, oh yeah. Churchill ripped off Thomas Mayles for an image. Well, actually, I did a couple more, too. And Tom Mayles knew it, OK, because those were not ripped off. They were adapted and interpreted to what I do, which was not what he was doing. He was making drawings. I do colorism. But here's the hot news flash. We're probably on to a conspiracy about the scope of the Illuminati now, because did you know that Jasper Johns painted the American flag, but he was not the original designer? <laughs> did you know, did you know that Marcel Duchamp did not invent the urinal? <laughs> did you know that Andy Warhol did not conceive of the layouts on Campbell's soup cans and Brillo boxes? And where was the outrage? Old objective reporters in the back when Fritz Scholder took one of the most famous images of the American West, which was the Anheuser-Busch image of Custer's Last Stand, and did a knockoff interpretation of that. This is, if you knew anything about it, which I suspect some of you do, such common practice that it would be unworthy of remark in any context. But let's assume for a moment that in my savage lack of integrity as a scholar, I actually did set out to rip Tom Mayles off. It seems rather unlikely on its face. Don't you think that I probably wouldn't have talked to him about it first? And then I would not have selected an image out of what was probably the best-selling book of its type for the entire period in which the work was done. Couldn't put it much more public than that. And if I was going to do that ripoff of that image from that perfectly accessible volume, I probably would have done it with a one-off painting rather than publishing an edition of the print 150 times over so it could be in full public view for the past quarter century. And by the way, why are you so slow? If that's breaking news, why did it take you a quarter century to figure it out? But this is the sort of thing that happens when someone gets up and speaks counter to the status quo and attempts to call things by their right name. They get that kind of spin, and it is monolithic. There has not been a break, and it is not reportage. It is, let's call it by its right name, propaganda. It is worthy of Joseph Goebbels. You don't have a propaganda ministry issuing you orders, although, as I understand it from the Denver press, you have editorial boards with vested positions that you're having to hew the line to. I understand that. But if you've got any integrity, if you've got any standards, stop talking about mine and get busy correcting the fault of your own profession. Return to the issues and come to grips with it. You got the capacity. Now do you have the guts and do you have the integrity to stand on what it is that you've been reviling me about? Stop treating this issue as an extension of how Indians have always been treated, either out of sight or out of mind, or reviled and treated as something we aren't and could never be.
Are you prepared to turn your profession into pursuit of truth, or are you simply going to adhere to the line that's put forth by your employers in the interest of power and preservation of the status quo? You answer it. Sit there smirking. Sit there smiling. Sit there smirking. But it's on you now. It's on you now and on you for real, on all your major networks that never show up to hear about the devastation of other peoples with your fancy preoccupation with a segment of 3,000 Americans, the only people who count. When America's news media reflects the sensibility of the population or the population compels the news media to reflect its sensibilities in such a way as you understand that those brown babies over there count just as much as these white babies over here that the white baby over here doesn't count a bit more than the black baby over here too, or the brown baby, or the yellow baby, or the red baby, that we all have value and are entitled to that human face. When that becomes a sensibility, when that is what is taught in the classroom, when that is what comes out in the media, we will actually have a basis for eliminating what it was that occurred on 911. But until that becomes the operant reality, you can kiss that prospect goodbye and permanently so, Dr. Yossi. Which I don't know how we're set up to do questions here. Is there a procedure that somebody outlined when I was still in the back and I didn't hear? Or what's happening? Nobody knows. Hmm. Anybody want to arm wrestle? Oh, just stand up and yell. It's okay, you don't have to raise your hand. This is not a classroom. Just stand up and yet one at a time, though, please. Ah. Uh, is that the only one? Clear over to the side? Okay. Okay, um, I'll have to admit that I haven't read any of your books or anything. And um, Good start. I just had a question about... Uh, <laughs> The, the little Eichmanns, I, I understand them as to what you've said as kind of like passive enablers, something like that. Well, they're active. They're just not direct. Yeah, There's I mean, not military. The distinction between direct and indirect. So I'm guessing uh, my question is um, which institutions, like aside from the military infrastructure, were you talking about? Just financial institutions or like what specific corporations or which industries were you um, signifying as what I'm my question is, I suppose, as far as the World Trade Center is concerned. I look at pretty much as a structural issue. All right, it's a diversified terrain out there. What were they going to hit? Mm -hmm. And I'm not particularly happy that they had to hit it at all. I think from their perspective, on the other hand, had would be the operant word because the information was out there. It's not that the public is uninformed. If I can find information, you can find information. The information is accessible, a lot of people access it, and then they ignore it because it's inconvenient. Well, that's a bit of a problem, even on a theoretical plane. But when your children, or those you hold dear, their children are dying, or you're dying, or your family's dying, the calculus changes. Symbolically, it was probably the best target. I don't know that it was. So, okay. so they, you don't think that's necessarily had a the most appropriate in, in a structural sense. I guess I was thinking of maybe the International Monetary Fund or the things that you know hold foreign nations in debt or something like that. Where is it? Yeah, that's probably what they said. Exactly. And here you got these things sticking up a thousand feet in the air. Yeah. yeah. 
And you're not using smart bombs, are you? Um, yeah, well, that's my question. I think the dot, 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 and you followed, followed the dancing dot, yeah? I was wondering, when do you think people um, might start respecting the holy land of Native Americans, such as the Hopi? Well, I figured to be somewhere around March 16th, 2016. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I mean, I, there's no way I can peg a time frame to a transformation of consciousness. All I'm saying is that the transformation of consciousness has got to occur. In which that which is of value to others is valued by you the same as you value yourself, you and yours. We're a very long way as a society from that. Even in my own societies, plural. People are subject to the same sort of indoctrination as everybody else in this society. Education is compulsory, but it's not education. You end up getting processed through a system that spends the better part of a third of your life if you live a full lifespan teaching you what to think, not how. You're continuously being expected to memorize and regurgitate soundbite answers to questions you've never had an opportunity to pose for yourself in order to pass the exam to get through. And then you get reinforced in that on the 6 o'clock news and in sitcoms and from every possible vector that you already have the answers to questions you haven't even formed in your mind. And if that's the processing, if that's the indoctrination, your critical facility is absolutely impaired and that's the intent. You'll just do what you're told and believe the opposite of everything is true if that's what you're told to believe. And we've got to break out of that box, break out of that box. I actually believe in sort of intrinsic goodness of people. That if you can get out of the box, if you can kick a hole in that plastic dome they put over your head, which is what I've been trying to do, you might be able to see things in a different way. And when you see things in a different way, you can share that with people and you can start a process of consciousness transformation that leads to the result I think we probably all desire. But if you leave this thing, this status quo, to function as it's ever more sophisticatedly functioning, you're going to be generating the kind of results that everybody purports to abhor. And the only reason that I'm hearing the abhorrence really is because it happens to some Americans, the impunity was ended. And that's all the fixation has been on. We've got to invert that. That's why I said that about the candles outside, no doubt being for the Iraqi children. When it is that those candles are for the Iraqi children, we will have gotten someplace where you can have some hope and begin to look at maybe a time frame. But this is kickoff on a long game. You follow? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to commend you on your uh, bravery and courage to stand next to your convictions and your, um, your words here. I think it's definitely worth uh, commending, and I think um, I'm, I'm personally very honored to have you speak here. Um, <clears throat> my question for you is, um, you speak about these ghosts and this, uh, this karma that is going to keep coming back to haunt uh, America. And my question is, as an American citizen, as a person that loves this country very much, um, what steps can I take personally um, to honor these ghosts and to change this uh, karmic cycle to uh, maybe better the future for my, um, for my children and to stop this um, terrorism and to stop this hatred towards America? Um, me, as, as an American, I feel very helpless, and uh, with this enormous uh, government that we have, I feel there's very little that I could do, but uh, I, I ask you now, uh, what could I do? Well, first of all, I didn't use the word karma. That's from another tradition, and I don't understand it particularly well, so I try not to do that particular appropriation. Ghosts, spirits, wraiths, all of that, I got a fair handle on. I live with them all the time. Most native people do. We're in touch with our ancestors. You might want to be in touch with yours. Some people are. Okay, they can tell you a whole lot. But the, the simple answer to your question, 
Because you want to end the hatred for the United States. Stop killing other people's babies. Well, I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not. Well, actually. <laughs> you know? But I'm, I'm actually, not. we all are. We I, all are. It's, it's, not, it's not a decision that I made. Yeah, it is. But, it's, but I'll come to that. I'm just a citizen. I, I, I don't have any say in, in our, our foreign policy. You're and, so uh, much less powerful than a Guatemalan peasant. See, this never comes up when you're talking in a third world context about the nature of oppression. Okay? They are relatively material, intellectual, educational, all those terms formally speaking, far more disadvantaged than you, but they don't feel so disempowered. And you really want to sit down and think hard about why that might be and what the effect of your relative privilege has upon your consciousness, your sense of self, and sense of capacity. But I was asked on Clear Channel, Oh yeah, now there's a no spin zone. <laughs> they asked me straight up, you ever killed anybody? Yep. I was in Vietnam in 1968, I certainly did. No, 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 that's not what we mean, that would be okay. Okay, you're killing brown people over there, preventing them from having their own form of government. We don't have any problem with that. No, I mean since you got back, so yep. I paid taxes. And my tax dollars translate into mass death abroad. And I've done that my entire adult life. I've done other things. I'm anything but innocent. See, my allegations, my characterizations didn't imply innocence to me. I'll be innocent when this changes. Am I going to give you a script for how to do it? No, because I don't know you. I don't know what your aptitudes and inclinations and capabilities are. I will tell you what your legal rights are. In fact, your legal obligations under the Nuremberg Doctrine are to do absolutely everything necessary to compel your government to adhere to the rule of law. It doesn't say everything except. That's the law. And it was articulated by a U.S. Supreme Court Justice by the name of Robert Jackson. Are you going to obey the law or not? That's the choice for you to make. If you're going to do things that are considered to be acceptable to the status quo and restrict yourself to that, you're going to preserve the status quo. That's why they decided these things were acceptable. So you can run through that whole list of things. You can change your diet. You can advocate for better bike paths. You can plaster no smoking signs in every flat surface in the Great Lakes area. You can wear the right running shoes. You can listen to Jim Page albums even. Or rage against the machine, depending on your preference, but you'd be kind of a dinosaur if you're listening to rage, so maybe forget about that. You need to be cutting edge. You can go through this whole list of things. You can do electoral politics. You can do charity work. You can do petition campaigns. You can do candlelit vig vigils. You can change incense flavors. You can do all of it. Take the right courses, back the right professors. Chart alternative media channels, ultimately, you have to channel that into some direct confrontation with power that transforms the functioning of power. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to look to how power perpetuates itself to get the answer. I suggest to you the proliferation of SWAT teams and so forth is the answer in itself. I object to the rules. Like I object to the justification of bombing civilian facilities in Baghdad when it's done by the United States, I would object to it on its face in reverse. But until you find a way to make it stop going that direction, you can hardly complain what comes back the other. You can follow the logic as well. How do you intervene? By whatever means ultimately are required to be effective. Fair? Thank you. Make your choice. All right. Uh, I don't think made him nervous with that one, didn't I? <laughs> oh my God, we might be responsible for doing something. Ooh. All right. Now that I'm in a room full of murderers, uh, 
Hello. Anyways, my question for you was... Do you really uh, think you have to kill somebody to do that? No, I disagree that... Uh, okay. I, I'd see your point, I just don't agree with it. But at any rate, my question for you is... <laughs> Fair enough. I, say, I can make your correlation, I just don't agree with it. But my question for you is, to what extent do you hold the international community and authoritarian regimes responsible for the deaths in their own countries, and what can be done on their part to prevent the deaths of their own people? Probably quite a lot. Probably quite a lot. However, you don't live in those countries, so stop displacing responsibility for what's wrong in the world no. from where you can actually do something onto something else, number one. And since you're, and I, in my view, quite rightly concerned with authoritarian regimes elsewhere, somewhere down the line of priorities, okay, you need to do whatever is necessary in order to prevent your government from putting them in place and propping them up. Because a great majority of authoritarian regimes over the last 50 years that have existed on this planet have been clients of the United States and nobody else. You withdraw U.S. support from them, political, military, financial, and they won't last 15 minutes. Their own people will take care of them. And you can start with Saudi Arabia. Okay? I, yeah, I appreciate it. The only concern you have with that is then you're getting into, you know, sanctions that can lead to their death. I'm sorry. I mean, getting into, like, if you don't, obviously, don't want to get into a war, but, like, the economic sanctions can lead to the deaths of people as well. So what really can we do as a nation to prevent deaths from happening at all? Because no matter what we do is going to have an effect at one way or another. Economically. What you can do, and I thought I said this, but I guess maybe I wasn't clear, so let, let me run through it. As a country, what you can do is obey the damn law and stop making up rules of convenience to yourself and acting like the corpus of international law and even the Constitution of the United States applies to other people for purposes of imposing order, but never to yourself when it's inconvenient might restrict your latitude of action. Try obeying the law, and I suggest it's probably not a panacea that's going to correct all the world's ills, but it'd be a gigantic step in that direction. And I suspect you might be a young man who champions the rule of law. Indeed I am. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate your response. So we should be on the same page, then should we not? No, I agree with you. I just, you know, I, I think that other people got to get involved too. Okay. Okay, people clap, so let me shut down the clapping perhaps. The rule of law in international terms begins right here tonight in Wisconsin with the treaty relations between the various indigenous peoples resident to the state of Wisconsin, as it is now known, and the federal government of the United States. If you look to the first article of your own constitution, you'll find out that treaties can be entered into by the federal government of the United States only with other fully sovereign nations. Not with tribes, not with gaggles or herds or flocks, PTA groups, corporate entities, municipalities, nothing other than another fully sovereign nation. And you ask yourself whether this state, within this country, this community, this university, you yourselves are actually according native people you encounter as being members of sovereign entities imbued with the rights comparable equal, in fact, to that of the United States itself. And I think after you take your long, deep breath, you realize, no, and you got some work to do right here at home. Yeah? Okay. Didn't hear any applause on that one. Funny thing. Good evening, and, and it is a good evening to have you here. And by the way, the Milwaukee Wobblies would like to give you an IWW calendar. <laughs> Okay, I'll take an IWW calendar. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about the genocidal American empire. Um, and if I could get your comment, uh, one of the contributors to uh, Counterpunch recently said that the U.S. is a, is a pre-fascist society. How far along the trajectory are we now to full-blown fascism? Well, I'd have to uh, respectfully disagree with the commentator in Counterpunch because I think we've arrived at that long time ago. Okay, it doesn't take the same form. 
doesn't take the same form as those models they keep wanting to point us to as being emblematic of fascism, but hey, guess what? These guys are not unintelligent. They're not going to come out in jack boots and brown shirts again and do things the same way. All the key ingredients of fascism have existed for quite some time, and they're getting more perfected and refined. And one of the most elegant ways of causing the system to function in that fashion is to manage to convince the bulk of the population exactly the opposite is true. But there's a good book on uh, that rather crude 1930s experiment with the process in Germany. It's called They Thought They Were Free. I suggest you read it just on the title alone. A lot of them genuinely did. They were freed from what? They were freed from this, they were freed from that, and they thought they were free. They actually elected the dictator. Okay? Okay, thank you. That's well, what I, I thought, pretty too. pretty far along, like about 10 points off the end of the chart in terms of having arrived at it. Hi there. Hi. I've read some of your work outlining how, for example, the concepts of John Locke have been used to justify legally the taking away of lands from Native Americans. And I think that's a powerful argument that you're making there. And I wonder how you reconcile that use of law with your call now to adhere to the rule of law. Okay, fair enough, but Locke wasn't a lawyer, all right? You have a codification of Lockean principles and philosophy and property law. Okay, but there's other domains of property law. There's arts, for example. And let me just put that out in virtually soundbite form. It would require, it's fairly complex, and it would require some explanation to get to, but it's not probably the place to do it, all right? You got a Eurocentric conception of property law that manifests itself in terms of ownership. I have a proprietary interest in this ground, this building, this whatever. I own it. It's mine. That's a real minority view, both historically and less and less, unfortunately, but still probably in the world today. At least with indigenous peoples, it's consistently property doesn't exist by that term. Our relationship to land, which vests us with, I guess, what we translate as a proprietary interest in it, is a responsibility to it. The exact opposite. The land's not responsible to us, owned by us. We are responsible to us because we are part of it. Our responsibility is to maintain, preserve, and hand it down in a form that it can be enjoyed by our descendants seven generations into the future in the same way that we enjoyed it. In order to be able to fulfill those responsibilities, we have, on the other hand, to have control over it vis-a-vis -vis other humans. So that's, that's ownership in another form, okay? That's an area of conflict in law. We have no conflict with regard to the implications of treaties, for example. We've got no conflict with regard to the prohibition on genocide, for example. We've got no argument with international law with regard to the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. We've got lots of commonalities there, and those are the elements of the rule of law that are paramount, and I'm calling for enforcement of or adherence to. If you're actually adhering to those paramount laws that we can hold in common, there's going to be a whole lot of beneficial fallout straight down the line in a number of subsidiary or tertiary domains. Fair enough? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, in your stream of consciousness, you kind of answered my question. But I still would like to ask, this is saying that you don't do the two before the one. A lot of individuals do the two before the one, meaning they go look elsewhere rather than clean their own home. Uh, I'm a product of systematic you know what I mean, uh, bogus and diabolical act. So I'm questioning, how, how does young white America go about having something tangible to do, to look forward to? Because, you know, doing to others as you would have them doing to you is just too broad. I don't think that concept they can grasp. So do you think you have anything tangible 
aside from, you know, overthrowing the government, <laughs> that would work. Well, I don't know about overthrowing the government, see. I got my own country, I got my own people, I got my own nationality. If they wanted to deport me, I guess they'd have to deport me to Oklahoma. <laughs> right? You follow what I'm saying there. So it would be ridiculous for me to be advocating the overthrow of the federal government of the United States or even of the state of Wisconsin. That's not something that I figure has a, a legitimate jurisdiction over me. So the way I look at it, I'm responding to just one portion of your question, I'll come to some others, okay? I'm not so much a revolutionary as I am a devolutionary. Devolve. In adherence to law, we got treaty demarcated territories, the U.S. is illegally occupying good chunks of it. Okay, according to the Indian Claims Commission, the U.S. has no valid legal title, not even a pretense, over, to, over about one-third of the 48 contiguous states. Those are still lawfully owned by indigenous peoples whose property were since time immemorial. There's been no treaty of session. There's been nothing. Okay? So I want the United States to conform to law and assume a configuration, if you will, territorially and consequently economically and politically in conformity with law that's very different than it is today. And that alters the capacity of the United States to act in the world as it has. It also stands to engender a rather different self-concept and perception of relations to others among those who fancy themselves to be citizens of the United States. But what do young white people do? They acquaint themselves with the idea that they actually need to know something about the world before commenting on it first. That's an obligation to actually use your learning capacity for something other than a ticket punch on the way to a better paycheck and a better standard of living that you need to actually understand the nature of the society in which you reside and they understand that in that capacity you, oh, this would be a good high school civics lesson, you have responsibilities, obligations to perform. And paramount among them is to assume the responsibility of ensuring that the law is actually applied and adhered to by those powerful as well as those less powerful. After that, if you actually have internalized that and take that as an obligation, not simply some sort of a fashion statement you can make to feel better about yourself on the way to the club that night, if you actually internalize that in a serious sort of way, I think I see a room filled with bright, intelligent, imaginative people who can harness their intellect and their imaginations to doing what it is that must be done in order to actualize that responsibility. To compel the government to obey law, compel officials to obey law, and get rid of them if they don't. I mean, for God's sake, all anybody's had to do in this country in the last 15 years is announce, I'm going to cut taxes if I'm elected, and into office they go. There's not even any political discourse out here. I'm going to cut taxes. I'm going to cut services as a result, but they don't bother to say that. I'm going to demolish the social infrastructure, but I'm going to increase profits to those who already are incurring them. And on that basis, everybody applauds. You get Tweedledee saying, I'll cut taxes for these guys, and then you get Tweedledum saying, I'll cut taxes for those, but basically, they're utterly demolishing the idea that you have a civic project or something to buy into, much less inculcating things like rule of law. You want that to change? You're going to have to change it. Individual initiative, individual consciousness, but that in itself ultimately is valueless unless you get organized. And I don't care what organization you join, but you're going to have to work in concert with others. You're not going to probably end up in mine. I'm probably not going to end up in yours, but if you're actually doing things in an organized fashion that approach these sorts of objectives, I'm individually and organizationally going to be working with you, pooling our resources, we can actually get it done. But what are the specific ways and means? Is that too abstract an answer still? No, that was good. Okay.
That was the final question? Yeah. It's been real. closing remarks here and we want to have a special thank you to all of you for making this a safe event and I'm going to introduce Susan Johnson from the political science department. Hi, I'm actually speaking on behalf of the College of Letters and Sciences uh, lecture series. I'd like to um, say that I'm proud of all the free speech that we've seen on campus this week and today and it's been great and um, I'd like to recognize Dean Howard Ross and his commitment to all of this and the other people on campus. Um, the, all of the students that have been involved, people like Paula Mohan and Steve Salaitis who worked really hard to make this happen. Okay. And we've got a couple more really good events planned for this um, spring that I want to announce. Ann Garrels from National Public Radio is on her way back right now from Baghdad and she'll be here on Monday talking about her experience as a war correspondent. And then Angela Davis, who we thought was going to be the controversial speaker this semester, is going to be here next month on April 11th. So March 7th, Ann Garrels and Angela Davis on April 11th. So join us again, please. Thank you. International community, the international world said this is the right thing to do. But when it came time to authorize the use of force on the Senate floor, my opponent voted against the use of force. Apparently, you can't pass any test under his vision of the world. Mr. President, new question, two minutes. You said that if Congress would vote to extend the ban on assault weapons, that you'd sign the legislation. But you did nothing to encourage the Congress to extend it. Why not? Uh, actually, I uh, made my intentions, uh, my, my views clear. I did think we ought to extend the assault weapons ban and was told the fact that the bill was never going to move because the Republicans and Democrats were against the assault weapon ban, people of both parties. Now, I believe law abiding citizens ought to be able to own a gun. I believe in background checks uh, at gun shows or anywhere to make sure that guns don't get in the hands of people that shouldn't have them. But the best way to protect our citizens from guns is to prosecute those who commit crimes with guns. And that's why early in my administration I called the Attorney General and the U.S. Attorneys and said put together task force all around the country to pr prosecute those who commit crimes with guns. And the prosecutions are up by about 68 percent I believe is the number. Neighborhoods are safer when we crack down on people who commit crimes with guns. To me, that's the best way to secure America. Senator? I believe it was a failure of presidential leadership not to uh, reauthorize the assault weapons ban. Uh, I am a hunter. I'm a gun owner. I've been a hunter since I was a kid, 12, 13 years old. And I respect the Second Amendment, and I will not tamper with the Second Amendment. But I'll tell you this, I'm also a former law enforcement officer. I ran one of the largest district attorney offices in America, one of the ten largest. I put people behind bars for the rest of their life. I've broken up organized crime. I know something about prosecuting. And most of the law enforcement agencies in America wanted that assault weapons ban. They don't want to go into a drug bust and be facing an AK-47. I was hunting in Iowa last year with the sheriff from one of the counties there, and he pointed to a house in back of us and said, see that house over there? We just did a drug bust a week earlier, and the guy we arrested had an AK-47 lying on the bed right beside him. Because of the president's decision today, law enforcement officers will walk into a place that will be more dangerous. Terrorists can now come into America and go to a gun show and, without even a background check, buy an assault weapon today. And that's what Osama bin Laden's handbook said because we captured it in Afghanistan and encouraged them to do it. 
So I believe America is less safe. If, if Tom DeLay or someone in the House said to me, sorry, we don't have the votes, I'd have said, then we're going to have a fight. And I'd have taken it out to the country, and I'd have had every law enforcement officer in the country visit those congressmen. We'd have won what Bill Clinton won. Let's go to a new question. For you, Senator Kerry, two minutes. Affirmative action. Do you see a need for affirmative action programs, or have we moved far enough along that we no longer need to use race and gender as a factor in school admissions and federal and state contracts and so on? Uh, no, Bob. Regrettably, we have not moved far enough along. Uh, and, and I regret to say that this administration has even blocked steps that could help us move further along. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm the, uh, I've served on the Small Business Committee for a long time. I was chairman of it once. Now I'm the senior Democrat on it. We used to, you know, we have a goal there for minority set-aside programs to try to encourage ownership in the country. They don't reach those goals. They don't even fight to reach those goals. They've tried to undo them. The fact is that in too many parts of our country, we still have discrimination. And, and, and affirmative action is not just something that applies to people of color. Some people have a mistaken view of it in America. Uh, it also is with respect to women. It's with respect to other efforts to try to reach out and be inclusive in our country. Uh, I think that uh, we have a long way to go, regrettably. If you look at what's happened, uh, we've made progress. I want to say that at the same time. During the Clinton years, as you may recall, there was a fight over affirmative action. And there were many people, like myself, who opposed quotas, who felt there were places where it was overreaching. So we had a policy called mend it, don't end it. We fixed it. And we fixed it for a reason, because there are too many people still in this country who feel the, the, the stark uh, uh, resistance of racism. And so we have a distance to travel. As president, I will make certain we travel it. Now, let me, let me just share something. This president is the first president ever, I think, not to, not to meet with the NAACP. Uh, this is a president who hasn't met with the Black Congressional Caucus. This is a president who has not met with the civil rights leadership of our country. If a president doesn't reach out and bring people in and be inclusive, then how are we going to get over those barriers? I see that as part of my job as president, and I'll make my best effort to do it. Mr. President. Well, first of all, it's, it is just not true that I haven't met with the Black Congressional Caucus. I met with the Black Congressional Caucus at the White House. And secondly, like my opponent, I, I, I don't agree we ought to have quotas. I agree. We shouldn't have quotas. But we ought to have an aggressive effort to make sure people are educated, to make sure when they get out of high school there's Pell Grants available for them, which is what we've done. We've expanded Pell Grants by a million students. Do you realize today in America we spend $73 billion to help 10 million low and middle income families better afford college? That's the access I believe is necessary, is to make sure every child learns to read, write, add, and subtract early to be able to build on that education by going to college so they can start their careers with a college diploma. I believe the best, uh, best way to help our small businesses is not only through small business loans, which we have increased since I've been the President of the United States, but to unbundle government contracts so people have a chance to be able to bid and receive a contract to help get their business going. Minority ownership of businesses are up because we create an environment for the entrepreneurial spirit to be strong. I, think, I believe part of a, of a hopeful society is one in which somebody owns something. Today in America, more minorities own a home than ever before. And that's hopeful. And that's positive. Mr. President, let's go to a new question. <clears throat> you were asked before the invasion or after the invasion uh, of Iraq uh, if you had checked with your dad. And I believe, I don't remember the quote exactly, but I believe you said you had checked with a higher authority. I would like to ask you, uh, what part does your faith play on your policy decisions? First, my faith plays a, lot, a big part in my life, and that's when I was answering that question, what I was really saying to the person was that I pray a lot, and I do. And my faith is a very, it's very personal. I pray for strength, I pray for wisdom, I pray for our troops in harm's way, I pray for my family. I pray for my little girls. But I'm mindful in a free society that people can worship if they want to or not. 
You're equally an American if you choose to worship an almighty and if you choose not to. If you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're equally an American. That's the great thing about America is the right to worship the way you see fit. Prayer uh, in religion sustain me. I, I'm, I, I receive calmness in the storms of the presidency. I love the fact that people pray for me and my family all around the country. Somebody asked me one time, well, how do you know? I said, I just feel it. Religion is an important part. I never want to impose my religion on anybody else. But when I make decisions, I stand on principle. And the principles are derived from who I am. I believe we ought to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. That's manifested in public policy through the faith-based initiative where we've unleashed the armies of compassion to help seal, heal people who hurt. I believe that God wants everybody to be free. That's what I believe. And that's one of the part of my foreign policy. In Afghanistan, I believe that the freedom there is a gift from the Almighty. And I can't tell you how encouraged I am to see freedom on the march. And so my principles that I make decisions on are a part of me, and religion is a part of me. Senator Kerry? Well, I respect everything that the, the President has said, and, and certainly uh, I respect his faith. I think it's important, and I share it. Uh, I think that uh, he just said that freedom is a gift from the Almighty. Uh, everything is a gift from the Almighty. And as I measure uh, the words of the Bible, and we all do, different people measure different things. The Koran, the Torah, or you know, Native Americans who gave me a blessing the other day uh, had their own special sense of 